Next up, we have Madoda Kamala from Sea Harvest. Uh, but before we introduce Madoda, we have a quick video which tells you why sustainability within the ocean space is so important. In 2015, global leaders adopted the Sustainable Development Goals. Goal 14 aims to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas and marine resources. Marine biodiversity, the variety of life in the oceans and seas, is critical to achieving this goal. It supports the healthy functioning of the planet and the well-being of humanity. For example, marine plants produce roughly 50% of atmospheric oxygen. Coral reef related tourism generates more than $37 billion each year. Marine fisheries and aquaculture contribute substantially to the income of more than 10% of the world's population, primarily in developing countries. Fish provides a critical source of protein and nutrition for more than 3 billion people. Coastal ecosystems, such as reefs and mangroves, protect coastal communities from storm surge and extreme weather events. More than half of the nearly 5,000 patented genes of marine organisms are being applied to medicines and human health. The ocean, however, is changing. It is under increasing pressure from unsustainable fishing practices, pollution, marine debris, habitat loss, ocean acidification, and climate change. Protecting and restoring marine biodiversity is critical to achieving the future we want sustainable oceans. Welcome back everybody and I think I'm saying this for every speaker we have today and I'm absolutely thrilled to have Madoda Kumalo from Sea Harvest joining us for the next session. Madoda, thank you so much for dialing in. No, thanks for having me. Uh, absolute pleasure. Mad <laughs> Madoda, I'm going to have to read your CV because it, it's quite lengthy and impressive. Um, but just for the to give our guests some context, I can see you chuckling away there. Uh, Madoda has a BSc Honours in Ocean Atmospheric Science and environmental management, as well as a Master of Science degree from the University of Cape Town. And I remember I did my undergraduate there, sitting on Jamison stairs and being very jealous of all those studying oceanography and marine biology. And they had the best building on campus and doing the things which I think most of us would have loved to have studied. Um, would that, um, Mr. Kumalo joined Sea Harvest in October 2014 and is now the Strategic Services Executive responsible for fishing, for fishing rights at least, and overseeing sustainability and corporate affairs. And Madoda is also the Scientific Committee Chair for the South African Deep Sea Trawling Industry Association. I won't even try to say that acronym in one big go, SATSD, I think it might be. But Madoda, you're Sorry. making my CV look quite pedestrian <laughs> right now. So. When we, when we caught up a couple of weeks ago and I proposed the idea of you participating today, I think it might, might have even been the end of last year. My memory is that bad. But um, I initially contacted you and in a similar vein, we had Sappy on earlier and quite a similar discussion where I'd contacted them and yourselves directly saying, or well, hoping to get your CEO on board. But the more yeah. I saw your CV and the more I chatted to you, I said, you're the exact person that I want to chat to today during our webinar. So again, thank you very much for joining us. And I know we are a bit squeezed for time, so I'm just going to hop straight into the first question. Um, like I said, the no audience problem. and I have context to your CV. Um, whenever we look at, as shareholders, I guess, of different executive committees within companies, you typically, and I think this is probably typical for Sea Harvest as well, getting a lot of engineers and chartered accountants and the odd actuary. So your CV has got kind of triggered me a little bit in, in terms of it standing out. So relative to your other EXCO members, I think you bring obviously a different perspective to the fishing industries and particularly the ocean. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I think it is, you know, to an extent. I mean, look, we mustn't get away from the reason, the rationale why in most businesses you've got the accountants and <laughs> the lawyers and the engineers. I mean, 
there's obviously common fundamentals that are required in any sort of business, regardless um, of what the makeup of that business is. But, you know, sort of really focusing in on your question, it actually does um, make quite a difference, you know, in the sense that due to my position and my background, I do mm. provide a different perspective um, to everybody else that's within our business. But I think also more importantly, I think sort of my role and in other sectors, where the company's primary driver is from the utilization of a direct resource, of a direct natural resource, more often than not, you will have that sort of speciality, whether it's mining, you'll have a geologist there, even though mining is heavily engineering and everything related to that. And you'll probably find it in other sectors that um, utilize primary resources. So for instance, in um, a furniture company or a paper milling company, you'll find that, you know, they'll have a silviculture is probably within somewhere, you know, within the bowels of the business in order to assist them to see that other perspective um, with regards to ensuring that there's, you know, a sustainable utilization of whatever resource um, they're tapping into. But I think, you know, if you sort of then come in more into what I do and sustainability and like, let me call it environmental management, which has also been now transposed into the oceans because that's obviously what we primarily focus on with regards to fishing. I think having a person like me or, you know, with that skill set or in any type of business, it is quite important where the planet is right now. I mean, over the past three to four decades, as we've sort of started to get an understanding as human beings about our impact on the planet um, individually and as organizations, that sort of understanding then needs to be crystallized and to people to provide context, people like me would do that within the business realm to say, listen, so this is where my business or our business fits within the overall sustainability or environmental health sphere. So I think with having, you know, certain specialties, uh, specialities or specialists rather within organizations, you know, only leads to greater understanding and it only um, leads to more creative thinking and I guess resilience in the future potentially. Mm. Thanks, my daughter. You're, you know the way to my heart. You're saying just the right things and you're leading me into my next questions and you spoke about the planet as a collective. And I mean, we based here on the tip of of Africa and we had the, the folks from SAPI earlier on the summit and uh, they spoke about their global operations. Um, you're obviously concerned with the fishing populations, I guess, off the southern African coastline. Uh, there was news recently about an Australian acquisition you've made. Uh, you also yeah. have, I think, product lines out in Europe, uh, North America, Southeast Asia, China. So although we're sitting down here, you have a wonderful view of Cape Town in your background. It's purely a, it's definitely <laughs> a global uh, footprint that you guys have. So um, I imagine, you know, r regulation and industry bodies, um, there are quite a few in your space and maybe you can touch on those that are more pertinent to you guys that you may subscribe to or where you may be leading in. Yeah, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, I think, no, you're right in the sense of operating in one sense or the other in different locales, whether it be directly through business ownership in that locale or through selling into those locales, you know, it, it's quite important. And I, I guess the market is always the driver, specifically in fishing when it comes to sustainability. You know, it's, it, it's quite important and there's all types of advisories and certification bodies throughout the world, which sort of try and get some sort of uniformity and help consumer or customers to understand, well, is this box of fish that I'm picking up at my local grocery store sustainable, even though it comes from literally the other side of the planet more often than not? Because, I mean, seafood is a really, um, or at least rather seafood trade is really a big business. So for us, it's been quite important to always utilize the best. So utilize the best advisories in order for guidance for our sustainability practices and really the most important one, and I guess probably I'll, I'll give you the most famous one because it's been quoted in a few um, areas within the sustainability space, specifically in ocean sustainability is the Marine Stewardship Council. And really that certification through SATSDIA, the acronym that you struggled to say earlier, um, basically um, the organization of big fishing companies in South Africa, which Catch Hake sort of banded together through the association and went and um, applied for MSc certification back in 2004 and really at that time we were at the vanguard you know it wasn't 
something that most people were doing in terms of ocean sustainability in order to ensure that they use robust scientifically um, measured methodologies in order to ensure that they're sustainable. So it's been quite important for us as ad adhering to MSC standards and being recertified for a five year period every year and just obviously most recently being recertified in 2021 is really to ensure our customers and our consumers that you know we're using scientific best practice in um, our sustainability management of the resource in particular the south african hate resource and you know that can't go into not enough time but you know if you spend enough time reading what the msc is about and the three principles which govern certification and allow you to have that blue tick you know, it will really crystallize that for a lot of people in terms of what we go through to ensure that we keep our resource sustainable. Mm. Now, I remember doing a tour, I think, of your your facilities, and I think there's some in the Cape Town Harbour here in the background there. Um, this is Saldana yeah. Bay up the coast um, here as well, as well as we work in Nedbank quite closely with WWF, and they have that, I think it's the SASI or the South African Sustainable Seafood Initiative, yes. which is that little card for your wallet that tells you whether yes. the food is or that fish is green yellow or red and if it's red obviously be careful about buying it but you spoke about the regulations i'm curious to know and um it can be quite a short answer we don't have to go into this one too much on the technical side in terms of you know the catching practices and the trawling because i imagine this feeds down into that so what's happening in terms of the real world and the in the actual fishing process and um, the type of nets maybe limiting bycatch am i on the right train of thought here yeah, no, you are. I mean, look, uh, um, in, in, in fishing, gear is everything, you know, um, the different type of gear basically is the method of fishing that you'd undertake. I mean, some have got a greater impact than others, whether it be on um, bycatch and selectivity um, or the ability to increase selectivity or it would be impacting the seafloor or other elements um, of uh, the ocean itself, you know, so beyond rather the target species. So, you know, it's quite important, specifically in the demersal trawl um, sector, in the sense that the cod end, which is basically the end of the net, basically where the net ends, you know, is quite important and that mesh size that's there because, yeah. you know, that does impact selectivity more often than not in a positive manner, you know, where you've got a reduction in the cross capture of species. Um, so it basically you'd allow more escape as it were basically based either on the morphology of a type of fish. So obviously thereby reducing bycatch to an extent, but then furthermore allowing juvenile fish, even the ones that you are targeting to escape, you know that it's a renewable resource. So you do want the youngsters um, to keep thriving and grow up into adults in order for you then um, for it or rather to replenish in the future. So that's um, probably the most important thing is the type of gear that you have and the mesh size. But I think also more importantly, beyond um, ensuring that legally you're within those permits, um, uh, uh, or permits of the of, of the current end and ensuring that your gear is correct, is actually behavioral modification. So probably two primary things I can think of off the top of my head right now in terms of what we do is that, for instance, if you're in an area where you do see that, you know, my last drag or my last bit of net had a bit of bycatch, you have a move on rule where you're going to go fish somewhere else where there's less of that species and where you can get, quote unquote, a cleaner net. Cleaner net would mean that you've got a higher percentage of um, your target species. So that's quite important. But then also another um, part of that behavior is always just measuring and monitoring where you catch fish um, and also what other impacts you've got. So legally, we have to record all the catches that we make, whether it be targeted or non-targeted bycatch. Um, we've got percentages that are legally um, you know, allowed thresholds rather that you cannot breach when it comes to the species. So, uh, you know, in the South African context, at least, it's not a free for all. I think a lot of people think you just throw your net in and you catch whatever and you come back to the factory. But there are a lot of prescripts that government has put in place in order to ensure that the target species is protected, but then all the ancillary species around that are also protected. Mm. I'm glad you said that fishing is all about the gear. I've got some good friends who are into fly fishing. So whether you're catching trout in a river or <laughs> thousands of hay yeah, out at exactly. the ocean, it's the same, uh, the same thinking and the same uh, approach to gear. Nice. But um, uh, you do allude to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, particularly, obviously, life be below water is the most material to you. And this is in your annual reporting as well. Um, 
things like sea spiracy, ocean plastic, these are all very kind of emotional topics and things that are becoming increasing material and maybe some sensationalist, but I don't want to go down that road of, of sea spiracy with you today. But maybe give us a quick answer in terms of the sense of where ocean life populations are in South Africa. I know they went through a troubling period maybe a handful of years ago. Are they up to a point where it's now sustainable and they, they're reproducing at the right rate? Look, the, the challenge that you have is that in South Africa, we've got probably 22 different commercial sectors um, and maybe about 10 to 14 of those are different types of species. And all of those species are at different levels of sustainability, you know, in terms of abundance and in terms of growth rates, the biology, the physiology, that all goes into whether or not something is sustainable. So I think in, a, in generalistic terms, you know, we do a lot of world-class science. When I say we, I mean as South Africa, whether it be the industry or the South African government, because we all represent South Africa Inc. at the end of the day, we've got world-class scientists that ensure or at least try to the best of their ability to ensure that we manage resources sustainably. I mean, it's enshrined in our act and in all of our legislation, uh, legislation, pardon me. And I think it differs. It differs across the board. I think I can specifically speak for um, KPEG in particular to say that it is looking good. I mean, we have to ensure through our certification that we do keep it looking good. But I think over the last probably 10 to 15 years, we've seen an increase and quite importantly, and not known to many people, as I said, we're at the vanguard of getting MSC quite early before it became in vogue um, in the sector, in the industry, particularly because we were actually worried about our stock. We were worried that um, catch rates were down um, about 20 years ago. We were worried that we need, or 15, pardon, 15 to 20 years ago, we were worried that we needed to make a change. And that certification sort of gives you the double whammy of a benefit of, number one, through that scientific rigorous assessment and experiments linked to it, you get a growth of your resource and an increase in catch rates, but then the secondary or ancillary, probably, you know, the beneficial part of it is that then consumers know that they, they, they're they taking something home and they're eating or consuming a piece of fish that comes from sustainable resource and sustainable waters. Yeah, I think that's a really good point that you mentioned at the end there, and it's come up in a few of our discussions almost unintentionally before you around the social side of things as well and we can't necessarily talk about feeding a population and food security in a separate breath to talking about where you know seafood populations are um, and i know the ocean economy has obviously incredible potential arguably less impactful um into environmentally at least compared to you know land cultivation and agriculture for that matter so um you guys are doing a lot of work i guess around that as well it's interesting to see the technology that's coming into play as well um, in terms of mapping populations i know if you chat to some of your captains you were there you know 50 years ago before you and i were probably even born said you know they didn't have to venture that far out for very long um, now you guys have your boats with obviously a lot of ice, etc., and refrigeration that they can guard for a little bit longer. Um, unfortunately, that is the nature of where the fish populations have gone, but that balance that you guys are getting right because it obviously is the most important input uh, into your business. And we have a couple more minutes, and I hope the audience can forgive me for, for stealing your brain on these ones because this is maybe a little bit selfish of me. Um, given what you studied, I'm very curious to know about your thoughts on, on climate change and, and the impact on the ocean um, and the relationship there? I mean, look, again, you know, it, it's always a challenge um, simply because as much as we'd like to sort of have a yes, no answer um, in life, it's never that black and white and in a system such complex as the environment, but also more complex with the oceans. And then that linkage with the atmosphere, you know, really makes it even more tenuous in terms of trying to have a crystal ball on a few things. But I think there's a few obviously established facts that everybody sort of got, a, got an understanding and an acceptance of in a general sense of that, you know, a big part of the ocean um, is utilized as a carbon sink, you know, with the, with the ability to extract um, or at least um, CO2 from the atmosphere, mixing with normal um, seawater and, you know, yielding carbonic acid. Naturally, as a weak acid that has an impact on on corals, you know, from a um, dissolution perspective in terms of coral bleaching. I think that's quite a well-known phenomena that even if people are not um, sort of understanding, let's say the climate change lexicon will understand. You know, when you say to somebody, listen, coral bleaching, they'll know that it's effectively the death of coral either um, through the dissolution of their shells or through increased water temperatures due to obvious, obviously from um, atmospheric feedback from changing climate. Now, 
what's quite important and what a person like me would be more interested in is how then does the change in habitats, i.e. the water and the change in seawater impact the resource in the water? You know, and again, this is also where it almost becomes more hazy now because that really depends on the adaptability of that species. How is it able to withstand the rigors of an increased or changed climate rather than the water? Um, can the species move to more and has hospitable environment? You'll know that if you've got a migratory fish, it probably can go seek out waters that are more comfortable for it and maybe it's got a higher chance of survival versus a fish that is sedentary or a seafood type that is sedentary. For instance, a lobster. A lobster will probably spend 99% of its life within a small little area. So it doesn't have that opportunity to mitigate that impact. So it differs in different ways, you know, but I think the established sort of understanding of fishery science is that basically there's two elements to it. Um, either fish or marine species that are able to that are able to move will either migrate polewards or they'll migrate equatorwards. That's actually really what the long and short of it is. You know, they'll move from their natural habitat either towards the um, cooler climes, um, either in the southern uh, southernmost part of the planet or the northernmost part of the planet in order to get sort of that temperature relief, but also potentially some species could move equator with um, seeking other types of waters. In particular, species that like warm water, um, that follow warm water trajectories, you know, they may be um, moving in that direction. But right now it is quite challenging to understand and as I said, to have a proper crystal ball um, to understand what would be the final picture, specifically on a certain type of fish, but on a generalistic um, element when you look at all sea life in this ocean. I think the audience will agree with me. We wish we had a full hour with you. This has been incredibly interesting and, and entertaining and, and thank you so much. And just keep uh, drumming that sustainability beat with your uh, accountant and uh, engineering colleagues. <laughs> but, uh, uh, yeah. Don't worry, I said will. They hear it from me now. Okay, thanks very much, my daughter. Take care and we'll, we'll catch up soon. Thank you very much.